Hello everyone, welcome to the History Value Podcast with your host, Jacob Berman. Today I'm joined by Professor Dennis McDonald, and the topic of this uh, discussion today is going to be on the two shipwrecked Gospels, the Q plus Papias Hypothesis, which is extensively discussed in this book. It's a great book, I recommend it. I'll, I'll leave the links to uh, his Amazon page and to the book in the description so you can go get it for yourself. It's a good read. Okay. That being said, um, Professor Dennis McDonald received his PhD from Harvard University in 1978 and has taught New Testament and Christian origins at Goshen College, the, um, the Iliff School of Theology, and the Claremont School of Theology from 1999 to 2020. He served as the director of the Institute for Antiquity and Christianity at Claremont Graduate University for the academic year of 1985 to 1986. He was a visiting scholar at Harvard Divinity School and for the spring term in 1991. He was a visiting scholar at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Twice he was awarded grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities. In 1984 to 1985, he was president of the Rocky Mountain Great Plains region of the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Biblical Literature. And in 2005 to 2006, he was president of the Pacific Ocean of the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Biblical Literature. He also has served on editorial boards, chaired program units for various professional societies, and he has appeared as an authority on the on A and E, PBS, and the History Channel. All right. Um, so thank you. So thank you for joining me today, Professor Dennis McDonald. And that takes me to my first question for you. Could you explain um, to uh, to the audience because there's probably people watching this video that may not be familiar with this. That is the Q plus Papias hypothesis. Could, could you explain exactly what the Q plus Papias hypothesis is? Um, let me begin by talking about what the synoptic problem is. It actually is one of the most complex and um, vexing historical problems of inter intertextuality that we have in the West. And it has to do with the three synoptic Gospels that are in the New Testament, the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And we know that they are intertextually connected, but we uh, continue to debate on how that works because we have conflicting evidence. And the two dominant ways that people have treated this is to say that there is a lost gospel cue from the German word Cavella that is known to Matthew and Luke in addition to Mark. So Mark is the earliest of the gospels, almost certainly. And uh, Matthew and Luke use it, but they also have so much shared content that one has to explain it either in terms of Luke's knowledge of Matthew or their knowledge of a common source. But sometimes Matthew is earlier than Luke, and sometimes Luke is earlier than Matthew, which has led people to think it must be a common source. This is the so-called two-document hypothesis. The other dominant um, position in scholarship right now is the so-called Farrer hypothesis, which is championed by people like Mark Goodacre. They argue that the Matthew-Luke overlaps are due simply to Luke's creative use of Matthew, and so they dismiss most of the arguments made for Q. Now, Mark is a friend of mine, I think, and um, he recognizes that there may have been a lost document, but in conversations I've had with him, he says, the criteria that are used for reconstructing Q are so problematic that we probably simply have to leave it as a hypothesis and not as a working hypothesis. My um, argument, however, is that there was a Q document. It actually was longer than most, and I call it then Q+. Plus. That's why we have the Q plus Papias hypothesis, and I'll be glad to explain now what that involves. First of all, it involves the priority of the Gospel of Mark. In all three of the positions I'm talking about, the Farah hypothesis, the two-document hypothesis, and the Q plus Papias hypothesis, 
affirm the um, origin of, uh, of the, the existence of um, Mar uh, the priority of Mark. I agree with criticisms of the two document hypothesis, which was what I actually uh, cut my teeth on and um, was for a long time a devotee of, that we have two problems in that hypothesis. One is that Luke almost certainly knows Matthew. And if there was a Q, it's likely that Mark knew Q as well. So the way people in the past have tried to reconstruct Q, and I know this is getting in the weeds very early, Jacob, so be sure to ask questions so we can sort it out. Sure, sure. But um, the way Q usually is reconstructed is to try to remove all evidence of Mark from Matthew and Luke. And then on the presumption that Luke doesn't know Matthew, to do work on oscillating primitivity. That is, sometimes Matthew is more primitive than uh, Luke, sometimes Luke is more primitive. And so by assessing the two as though they are independent, one can tease out what um, the lost gospel looked like. Uh, I agree with those criticisms, but I also have criticisms of the fire hypothesis. We know from Papias that there was an alternative version of the Gospel of Matthew that has not survived. So we have a evidence of a lost gospel. Luke, in his preface, says that he's consulted many works that have attempted to describe Christian origins, especially the experience of Jesus. But uh, the Q hypothesis uh, usually says that he only consulted two, that is Mark and Q. My hypothesis argues that he knows the Q document, he knows Mark, he knows uh, Matthew, but he also knows Papias's exposition. And that makes it really quite a radical hypothesis. But it really is not as radical as one might think. In addition to evidence that we have a lost gospel somewhere that resembled Matthew, we can ignore Luke altogether and simply compare Matthew and Luke in what are called doublets. That is, Matthew repeats content that we know one of the examples comes from Mark, but the other does not. And in every case, and we're talking about 28 examples of um, doublets and non-doublets, I won't explain non-doublets, but they're, simple, they're simply a, a variant on the doublet, where Matthew's um, non-Mark inversion is more primitive. So um, we can suggest that it comes from oral tradition, but it's possible that it also comes from a text. The other thing is that this material appears in a different sequence from Mark, but also um, not only is it more primitive than the Mark and equivalent, but it has a coherent understanding of who, what Jesus's message was. Um, now, most of the time, and even in two shipwreck gospels, I use literary models to try to reconstruct the Q document. No, I left out Luke. Then one can look at Luke, and Luke also has doublets and non-doublets that are more primitive than what he would have inherited from um, from Mark. So what are so some... Uh, that, I'm sorry? Oh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I was just going to briefly ask, what are some examples of these doublets that you're talking about, of these uh, differences? <laughs> Um, Matthew has two versions of Jesus's um, statement on a divorce. One of them appears in Mark, in which divorce is prohibited both from the man's side and from the woman's side. The other version, in the, and Matthew repeats that, but the other version in Matthew makes it only um, a, an equivalent to the, the man. I mean, the, the prohibition applies only to the man, not to the woman. 
And it's in the context of a quotation from Deuteronomy 24, or an allusion to, 20, to Deuteronomy 24, where a man cannot put his wife away. So almost all scholars say that Matthew knows a more primitive version that is interacting with Deuteronomy, and that um, Mark knows it from a similar source or tradition and makes it applicable to the Greco-Roman context where women divorce men, not as often, but um, like men divorce women. So um, that would be just one example. I can give you, uh, you don't want 27 more, but <laughs> that would be an example of where uh, Matthew is more primitive. Now, but there are some other things that I want to mention. Not only is the issue philological, Jacob, Mm. It's also social, and I um, am also um, <clears throat> developing what's called um, social identity criticism. That is, we know um, we, a branch of sociology is called social identity theory, mm. and it says that social groups are held together with certain predictable con uh, commitments. One is the stereotyped in-group. Who are the good guys? Who are you writing for? Um, who are your followers? The other is stereotyped out-groups, where various groups are considered to be threats or outsiders. And these in-groups often have prototypical leaders, uh, like Donald Trump for the, the, um, the alt-right. Mm. And um, so you can identify in the Gospels that Jesus is the prototypical leader of all these Gospels, but he has a different function in them. And it's often a social function, whether he is um, a, a, he's combative about Jewish religion, or he's the compassionate teacher, or he's the miracle worker, or the parable speaker. We also have different in-groups. Um, so who are the good guys? The Gospel of John is a very good example of having very distinctive social markers of who the good guys are. Mm. But you find it in the synoptics as well. But you also find, and this is actually the most important piece, stereotyped out-groups. Who are you writing against? Who are you vilifying? What name do you call them? And the Q document, once we isolate these materials that could come from a, a lost gospel, they have a social identity that is different from what goes on in the synoptics. And you can see that over and over and over again, the synoptic authors in their own way change the wording for the, the Jesus figure and his followers to conform to their idealization, their stereotypes of themselves and of others. Um, but there's one other piece of this that is really important, but it's not directly um, relevant to the Q hypothesis, but it is indirectly. That is the extensive use of classical Greek poetry in the synoptics for um, the narrative. And I've written a dozen books on this topic, and it still remains highly uh, problematic. I have a lot of skeptics about it. Uh, books like the Gospels in Homer, the Homeric mm -hmm. Epics in the Gospel of Mark, Luke and Virgil, and so on. Now, the reason that that's important to your question, Jacob, about mm -hmm. what the Q hypothesis is, is if one takes a look at that material where the synoptics are most heavily indebted by narrative to um, the uh, Homeric epics, and you kind of can erase that from the Gospels, what's left looks very much like Q, whether or not you have linguistic markers as well. So um, the, the very simple response to your question is going to be this. No one's going to solve the synoptic problem unless they wrestle with two interrelated issues. One is taking the synoptic gospels as they are, finding 
how much they are indebted to antecedent Greek poetry, especially Homer and Athenian tragedy. Then it's important to take into account at a really microscopic level how the parallels between Matthew's uh, doublets and non-doublets and Luke's doublets and non-doublets tease out the Q document. Now, I'm going to say something that people will bristle at, and I probably will regret having said it. But many people who are skeptics about Q haven't done their homework. And I would say they're actually lazy. And um, that's, that's why, you know, I saw your eyebrows rise. Mm -hmm. But I think Q skeptics are, it's so much easier to dismiss the evidence than to wrestle with it. And um, it takes some sophistication in Greek. It takes some patience. It has, it takes methodological rigor. You have to set up criteria for what makes something early or late. And it's not easy. And I understand that. So the book that you held up, Two Shipwreck Gospels, was my best attempt to make it as easy as possible to comb through the material, to make the arguments in English primarily, and to let people make their own judgments about whether these arguments are uh, successful. So mm. that's a, I know that's a, a windy answer to your question, Jacob. But um, maybe that that'll give you something to ask questions about. Oh yeah, it was it was a great answer, and I and I and I appreciate it. Um, I love detailed answers. It was a great answer to my question. Uh, but that but that does that that definitely takes up uh, takes me to the, to the next question I plan to ask you because you brought up Deuteronomy, and I know in your book you argue that the Q document seems to be structured in some kind of way, based on the writings of the Book of Deuteronomy. Could you talk about that? The the title of the book likely was the Logoi, or the mm -hmm. words of Jesus. The book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew was known as Hadabarim, the words. And the first in the Septuagint, the first, that is the Greek um, Genesis, uh, uh, Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. the, it begins, these are the Logoi, the words that Moses spoke in the wilderness. As far as we know, the Q document began with the words or the Logoi of Jesus, and John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness. And immediately he has to say he's not the one to come, a prophet like Moses, but one's going to come after him who is stronger. Jesus then is uh, uh, commissioned as a prophet the same way Ezekiel was, but then he is tempted by the devil three times, and in each case, he's, he quotes Deuteronomy to put the devil in his place. Mm. Then um, he, collect, he has 12 disciples. He takes them up on a mountain. He preaches them a new Torah. And in many cases, you can see where in uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Jesus is interacting with uh, legislation and makes it more compassionate. Then he ends his inaugural sermon with the series with uh, blessings and curses. That is the one who heeds these words is like a person who built a house on rock. And when the floods came, um, the, it will endure those who do not obey uh, or heed these words. And it, they're called logoi, right? The he heeds these words. Um, is like a person who built a house on sand, and when the floods came, it was destroyed. At the end of Deuteronomy, you have several streams of blessings and curses for those who um, obey and those who do not. And then when Jesus gets involved with disputes, the disputes often have to do with Jewish law. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, his uh, opponents are called... Uh, Pharisaioi, that is Pharisees, and uh, mm. uh, uh, Nomikoi, the lawyers or the Torah enforcers. So Deuteronomy is present, especially in the first half of the book, but it really exerts some of, some influence 
on the entire thing. Jesus is the promised prophet like Moses. He's the one to come. He can do miracles just as Moses did in Egypt. And this is the Beelzebul controversy, which other people have recognized. So um, this is a Jewish document. It, it's not a Christian document, Jacob, in my mm. view. It's a Jewish document that is re rewriting Deuteronomy to make Jesus the champion of compassion so that the, the strenuous and callous imposition of Jewish law on life um, creates casualties and the Jesus character of Q is trying to ameliorate those, those, those uh, problems. So this is why he says, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. Mm. Um, so he uh, is compassionate to uh, sinners and outcasts and heals the sick and so on. So he becomes a champion of the marginalized. And in that way, he's, a, he's the hero for the author of Q. That's, that's incredible. And I, I, I I'll, I'll have to say that this, um, I found your argument very convincing that Q is structured on Deuteronomy. I found those parallels to be amazing. Um, and and I know you get into, in, in your books, you talk about Jesus was a Torah reformer. Right. Based on, largely based on what the Q document says. Could you get into that? Um, largely based on, I'm sorry, the, the teachings in the Q document, um, Jesus being a, a, a Torah reformer, trying to, uh, modify Judaism in some kind of way. Uh, well, let's, um, step back a little bit okay. and look at, um, the author of the gospel of Mark knows Q, mm. but he's not interested primarily in Jesus as a, um, a Torah reformer. So he has no inaugural sermon. There's no Sermon on the Mount or Sermon on the Plain in Mark. Rather, there's a parable speech because Jesus is keeping his identity a secret, like Odysseus. Ah. And he's interested, Mark is interested in him as a martyr and as a miracle worker. And, um, uh, and he keeps his secrecy the way Odysseus does at the end of the Odyssey. And he dies heroically like uh, uh, like uh, Hector. But Matthew inherits the Torah reforming Jew of the Q document and the hero of Mark. And he uses the Markan story, but he finds the Q document to be radically, too radically hostile to Jewish law. So he um, adopts it but he changes it in certain ways so that actually Jewish law is reaffirmed for his community. Um, the Lucan author um, is the one who retains the Q wording most faithfully, and he has his own way of talking about Jesus's criticism of the law because he's moving into a Gentile world with Luke Acts. And so the, um, the criticism of Torah actually works better for his agenda than it does for Matthew's or for Mark's. So it's only in Luke's version of the Q document that one sees in extant gospels, the radicalism of the Q document and its understanding of law. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that the author of the Q document is against Jewish law. He's against its callous interpretation, and he gives his own alternative readings of the law. You're probably familiar, Jacob, with the story of Jesus forgiving a woman taken in adultery that appears in certain copies of the Gospel of John. Yep. Well, it doesn't appear in those copies of the Gospel of John until Latin texts in about the end of the third century. Awesome. But I attribute it to Q. It's mm. actually earlier than the Gospels. And we can find traces of it in the synoptics. But here's the reason I want to mention it. Jesus enigmatically uses his finger to write something in the dirt. And he does so twice. Mm. 
And uh, even in antiquity, people didn't know what he was writing. I'm going to tell you and your viewers what he was writing. He was rewriting the Jewish law that said that uh, promiscuous women should be stoned. But in the Septuagint, God writes that law with his finger, his doctolus, in stone. Jesus is rewriting it, which is a kind of affirmation, but he's writing it in the dirt. It is not permanent. It is flexible. And that's what the author of the Q document is. I actually think that that is metaphorical for what the Q document wants to do. It wants to have Jesus affirm the law, but make it compatible to those uh, who are marginal in Jewish society. So um, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that, that's amazing. That's a, that's a pretty good parallel there. Um, so why do you think, I, I, how should I put this? Okay. One of the examples that you, uh, that's often given for why the Q document is most likely to have existed is the brood of vipers saying in Matthew and Luke, but Luke's version is different from Matthew's version. And Dr. Goodacre um, tries to say that Luke got the whole thing from Matthew and the Brood of Vipers just, I think he puts it like it just shows up in Matthew and it doesn't need to come from another document. But, but in other cases, he appears to argue that they could have used an oral tradition without a Q document being necessary. Um, so I guess that, I, I guess that frames the question uh, in this in this manner, do you think the brood of vipers is one of like, would you say that's one of like the best examples about why the Q documents most likely to have existed? Um, no, I don't. But okay. let me, Jacob, I I do affirm that Luke mm -hmm. knows Matthew. Right. So theoretically, Luke could have known it in Matthew, and I'm presu I presume that he did. Mm -hmm. But. That whole business about brood of vipers needs to be taken in the larger context of evidence for John the Baptist in the Gospels. And um, it's not the case that Matthew was always prior, uh, prior to mm. Luke in those examples. So this is where the argument has to become really granular. Yes, you can explain some of the parallels by saying that Luke simply knows Matthew. And I agree with that. Luke knows Matthew. But it doesn't explain everything. And it doesn't explain everything in the John the Baptist business. So um, the other, I found a, a little more interesting, the second part of your question, Jacob, mm. because when I talk to Mark, and I've done so actually on another video session, he said you can't appeal to oral tradition because oral tradition doesn't exist. Mm. Yes, people talk to each other. Yes, there was an oral tradition, but there's no way to control it. It's like pulling a rabbit out of the hat. Um, it's just you can't appeal to oral traditions seriously as a way of solving the synoptic problem. The synoptic problem is a literary problem. And you have you, yes, people talk to each other. Yes, there was an oral tradition, but we don't have, um, we didn't, we don't have microphones and computers to you know record what they said. So um, I would be surprised in this case that he would argue for oral tradition as a way of accounting for um, for those similarities. Um, yeah. So um, that being said, there are arguments in scholarship from scholars like uh, um, Dr. Burton L. Mack. He argues that there was multiple redactions of Q in the first century CE. Um, do you think that was the case too? Or do you think it was just, it was one document and the redactions don't take place until Matthew, Papias, and Luke wrote their own versions of the document? Um. I find compositional histories for Q to be entirely unnecessarily unnecessary and unconvincing. So um, 
But that said, it be, given the way that ancient manuscripts worked, Jacob, mm. the copy that Matthew had of Q was different from the copy that Papias had. It's different from the copy that Luke had. And if Mark had it, Mark's copy would have been different too. Mm. There, uh, with this material, we can see, in fact, in the synoptic problem itself, how plastic the transmission of these texts was. So I'm very clear that my reconstruction of Q plus is the best I can do with the criteria that I have, but it surely is not identical to any copy of Q that was circulating in antiquity. That said, I see no reason to think that there were um, extensive um, compositional um, evolutionary moments the fit I could put that way, oh. where we have uh, Q1, Q2, Q3. Mm. Most of the time, people do that on the basis of literary judgments. And I really find them to be quite unsatisfactory and unscientific. How, um, when do you date the Q document? Um, how long after, t after Jesus' time do you think it, uh, it was written? Um, the way we, um, and you know this, Jacob, the mm -hmm. way we date ancient texts is with um, <clears throat> uh, spans of time and not, you know, particular dates. But I think we can be pretty clear that it's written before the Jewish war because the, the, the temple is still standing, if my reconstruction is right, and people are still visiting it and giving sacrifices and so on. But the author knows that um, d destruction is coming in the future, whether it's from Jesus. There's no anticipation of Rome um, being the problem, but there are anticipations of um, conflicts and things aren't going well. So I think a date somewhere in the early 60s is probably right. Um, those who would like to use the Q document for reconstructing the teachings of Jesus, though, would like to take it back to the 40s. Mm. Um, because we also know of temple upheavals through Josephus, a uh, temple, Jose uh, temple um, squabbles and so on happening then. One of the ways of judging that for some people is how um, numismatics plays a role. That is, what kinds of coins or what kind of uh, economic features do we have in Q that indicates when um, the, um, the temple would have been, uh, uh, when the book would have been written. Um, I just don't find that to be satisfactory because um for all kinds of reasons but um so so my guess was would be in the early 60s yeah i, I asked that question because i know that there are there are scholars with uh, a wide variety of different opinions on when it, on when it dates like um i recently interviewed professor bart ehrman and he he's like he, he doesn't take a position on the dating necessarily it just he just says oh, i don't know what it was written um he, he said something like that during the interview uh -huh. um he just but it had to be before matthew and luke it's basically pretty much pretty much what he said to me on the other hand you have dr uh, carrier who argues that that q is familiar with the jewish war and that because mark in his opinion doesn't use q and, and, and as you know he doesn't think Q existed he he thinks that if it did exist, it must post date Mark, which leads no, me. I mean, actually, he and I have talked about this, mm -hmm. and it has to do with how one reconstructs the Q document. In my Q document, the, the temple clearly is existing, and I've actually showed him the evidence, and um, so I don't know that he's convinced by it. Mm -hmm. But um, in the inaugural sermon. You know, when you bring your gift to the altar and somebody has some uh, grievance with you, be reconciled and then bring your gift. Mm 
So um, it's in device to the reader um, at a relatively late date. Now, of course, it's also a criticism of the temple. You know, the temple forgiveness isn't sufficient. You need to be reconciled with your opponent beforehand. But um, there are other people, too, who um, make a similar claim that you've got evidence that the temple is still... Um, well, here's another piece. In my reconstruction of Q, um, you have the statement, look, you're, Jerusalem, your house is forsaken. Now, that doesn't mean it's destroyed. It really means that God no longer is residing in it and God will not protect it. And then the next saying is the temple word, in my view, that is, I will come and destroy this temple and build another that is not made with hands. Now, that means the temple's got to be existing because Jesus hasn't returned yet to destroy it. Now, Mark knows that saying. He doesn't like it. He puts it on the lips of false witnesses and mockers at the cross. But you don't create a problem in order to solve it. So he gets it from somewhere, and uh, I'm convinced that he gets it from Q. So yeah, that takes me to my next question, because you bringing up uh, Mark there is perfect for this next question. What led you to the conclusion that Mark actually knows Q? Because uh, scholars typically think, as you know, that Q was used by Matthew and Luke, but it represents material not in Mark, so they think Mark didn't use Q. So what led you to conclude that Mark used Q? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the circularity of that reasoning with the Q, with the Q hypothesis. Mm -hmm. you, they start with the notion that, Q, that Mark doesn't know Q, mm -hmm. and then they get rid of Mark, and then they find the other stuff, and therefore Mark can't know Q. There's a version of the... Um, <coughs> Q hypothesis called the modified two document hypothesis. And um, one of the overlooked scholars in this field, who's absolutely remarkable as a scholar, is uh, Harry Flaterman. Mm -hmm. Harry Flaterman did an amazing book. Unfortunately, it's extremely expensive. It comes out of Europe um, and uh, didn't get much traction even in the two-document hypothesis. But he certainly is right and is a pioneer in so much. Even after, because of the doublets and non-doublets that you have in Matthew and Luke, even after you get rid of um, the... Um, uh, uh, wait, you, ha you have so many... You, so, once you get rid of the Mark and equivalents of all these things, and you have the doublets and non-doublets in Matthew and Luke, you get a document that has so much in common, 72 verses, Jacob, mm. that are the same in the reconstruction of Q and in Mark. If you saw that density of parallels of, of sophisticated sayings in any two ancient documents, you'd be required to say there's a literary connection. So the, the best evidence we have that Mark must have known Q are these um, non-Mark and doublets and non-doublets in Matthew and Luke. Now, as soon as I say it, your viewers are going to know how complex that issue is. Mm. Because you have to go saying by saying to establish its independence. And you have to have criteria to determine which of the two Matthean doublets or Lucan doublets is more primitive than the other. Um, but it can be done, and people have done it. But um, you said nice things about two shipwrecked gospels. To the extent that you've read it, you know it is not easy reading. Right. Yeah. It is a very technical, detailed, and I did my best to do it in English and to make sure that the uh, the, the parallels are... Uh, are trotted out. I try to give my criteria. So I, I try to be as scientific as I can be. And maybe somebody's going to come along and do it better. But I don't buy the uh, dismissal of Q and the Mark Q uh, parallels s simply by people that are not willing to do their homework or engage the arguments. And uh, you may, may not know that very few people have engaged the arguments in that book. Mm-hmm.
since you identify the, the lost gospel of Matthew that Papias talks about uh, with the Q document, do you think that connection is what caused church followers to mistakenly claim the gospel of Matthew was the first gospel because in reality there was an earlier gospel of Matthew called Q, which is the Q document that the other gospels used since Mark is first but in between Q and Matthew our gospel of Matthew well Papias wouldn't know the relative dating that we do okay what he knows is he's got three Greek Gospels. Mm -hmm. He does not know Luke. He does not know John. He's got three Greek Gospels. He looks at them and he sees that Mark is shorter than the others. He then sees that you have a lot of overlapping content between Matthew and this other document. And that's what he says. And then he says, but they all have, they have similar content, but they have them in a different sequence. Mm -hmm. So he, in his exposition, he says, I want to restore the order of Matthew's Hebrew original. So, um, and he, then he says, Mark was simply taking notes of the preaching of Peter, and he's the one who translated into Greek. Matthew, on the other hand, was a, a disciple of Jesus. And by the way, the name Mark is not identified in the circle of Jesus. It's a Latin name. Um, so Mark um, is derivative from Peter, but Peter didn't write anything. Matthew wrote his gospel, and two Greek uh, translators botched it. Mm. And he wants to restore the sequence of them. So he's convinced that none of the Greek documents that he has is pre uh, preserving the words of the apostles. Mark did the best he could, but um, he would, Peter was preaching and he wasn't putting things in sequence. Mm. So Matthew probably has a better sequence but there's another Matthew that has things in yet a different sequence. And in some cases, I don't know, he doesn't say so. He would have recognized that it is both shorter and um, in some cases more primitive. So what, Ma what Papias wants to do is to put it back in its Matthean sequence. Mm. And, um, and I think that's what he does. And you can find that in the fragments that reta are retained by um, Eusebius and others of Papias, they follow the, um, the Matthean sequence. Do you think it is possible, um, by any chance, that the author of the Q document might have been one of the famous uh, disciples of Jesus mentioned in the, in the New Testament? Um. I suppose it's possible, and that's my hesitation. Okay. Um, let me put it this way, though. The author of the Q document was not merely transcribing his memories of the historical Jesus. There is another layer of um, sophistication and, and development that's in the Q document. If you read most Qs, Jacob, you'd see that it's simply an arrangement of various sayings. Yeah. People, form critics, have loved to look at it and say, well, maybe these are coming from an oral tradition. Maybe they're historically reliable and so on. But according to my reconstruction, there are two primary literary impulses, and there are other modest ones. So you can see that the author is being creative and not being historically um, scribal. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, these influences we've talked about, one of them is Deuteronomy. The other, and I have not yet published this, but um, I'm ready to any time, there are echoes of the Odyssey already in Q. Wow. And, um, and, and that's... Yeah, I can. I think I can make a pretty, a pretty strong case for that. 
but it's not advertised. He's mm -hmm. not trying to say that Jesus is better than Odysseus, but um, the, the Jesus of Q is keeping his identity a secret in a way. He's testing his disciples to see if they're going to be faithful. He promises to return and to punish his enemies and to reward those who are faithful. And there are actually uh, a few passages that just point by point by point follow the Odyssey in the creativity. So that Jesus in Q is a hero, like a Greek hero, but he uses heroism to transform Jewish law. Um, and it really is such a brilliant project that I doubt if any of Jesus's fo immediate followers had that capacity. Um, because it really had, it really is a schoolish enterprise. I know that probably blows your mind. It, it blew mine when I realized it. What are, uh, what are some of the examples uh, um, that you can provide of these parallels between Q and the Odyssey? Um, the, the ones that are the best, I think, near the, are near the beginning, and they don't compare Jesus to Odysseus, but to his son Telemachus. Mm. So I'm going to tell you what happens to Telemachus at the beginning of the Odyssey, and you'll be able to tell me what the equivalent is in the Jesus story. Don't worry about my reconstruction of Q. But it, um, it, these are defensible as coming from Q. Telemachus is a young man who isn't sure of his paternity. He they can't remember his father because Odysseus went off to fight in Troy when um, he was just a lad. His house is being devoured by Penelope's suitors. And Athena wants to empower him. So she talks Zeus into sending her to Telemachus and she disguises herself as mentor and she flies to him. She tells him that he is indeed the son of Odysseus and empowers him to claim his father's kingdom. In the gospel of, uh, in the Q document, um, John the Baptist says, someone is coming who is stronger than I. Then he baptizes Jesus and the Holy Spirit flies to him like a dove. The Athena flew to and away from Odysseus, Hosernus, like a bird. The Spirit tells Jesus, you are my son. Athena told Telemachus, uh, uh, the, told Jesus, uh, no, no, to, told Telemachus that he is the son of his father. So what happens then? Jesus goes out and announces the coming of the kingdom of God, his father, a way it doesn't declare it uh, publicly. Um, so what does Telemachus do? He um, tells the suitors they'd better get out or he's going to destroy them or he'll, he'll push them out. So this empowerment of the youngster by a flying deity that tells them about his father is potentially folkloric, but there are other parallels that, um, that uh, occur later. Over and over again in the uh, lost document, and this is true for the Q document, not just for my reconstruction of it, you have what are called the servant par um, master parables. And it goes like this. There's a man who goes on a journey. Read Odysseus. And he puts his slaves in charge, each with their own um, uh, task. Eurycleia in the Odyssey is in charge of uh, taking care of Penelope. Eumaeus is in charge of the, the pigs. Uh, Philodius is in charge of the cattle and Melanthius in charge of the goats and the others have their distribution of responsibilities. He goes for a long time and you don't know it in, in, the, in the parables. He's gone for a long time and people don't know when he's going to return. 
Well, the, the slaves didn't know when he's going to return, and not all of them were faithful. So when Odysseus gets back, the ones that are faithful, he rewards. And the ones that are punished, that, that are not, he punishes. Now, what does he do to Melanthius? He cuts his body into pieces. What happens in the parable of the master's delay? The one who eats with the drunkards, that is the suitors, the master dismembers. He cuts his body into pieces. Duh! The parallels are astonishing. And we have four of these um, um, servant-master parables where the master goes off for a long time. Some people are, are faithful. Some people are not. That's the theme of the Odyssey. Um, and there are other examples, too. Going back to the... Um to the Q plus PPS hypothesis. Yeah. And before I uh, get to the question, those are amazing parallels. It, it just sounds, uh, when you got to the part when you, when you were talking about that, he announces that who his father is. It, it just reminds me of the, of the nativity story in the Gospel of Matthew so much. It reminds me of Jesus is becoming, the, he is announced, predicted to become the king of the Jews, a hero in the story. But those are amazing parallels. It's very convincing. Um, so going back to the Q plus Papius hypothesis, other than Papius not knowing Luke and John, what led you to the conclusion that Luke had to have used Papius' expositions? <laughs> there are two um, telltale passages. One is that when Luke writes his preface in his gospel, the first four verses, he uses the same vocabulary that Papias used in his, the introduction to his volume about trying to um, create a diegesis that is coherent, that people can trust. He has followed all of his sources, but the big one is Papias says people got the the gospels that he has has the toxis wrong that is the order and that's luke's problem too he wants to put things into the correct order akrebos um, to to write accurately uh, akrebos to get things in the right uh, uh, order but the one that's most interesting is the death of Judas. The death of Judas in the Acts of the Apostles has much more in common with Papias's version than it does with the Gospel of Matthew. And by comparing them, the only way I think that you can make sense of the parallels between the three accounts is to say that Luke knows both the version in Matthew and in Papias. Yeah, that, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so the going back to the Q document having uh, used Homer's Odyssey, I know you said earlier about the author of the Q, uh, that, that the Q document is a Jewish document, not a Christian document. But since he uses the Odyssey, does that make him some sort of? Would you say that would make him a Hellenistic Jew at least to some degree? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, but I would say he's also bilingual because you have um, Aramaic words that are used without translation. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that he's bilingual, but he expects his readers to be bilingual. So occasionally um, in the other Gospels, you have translations of the words to, to have them make sense. So I would say he's probably a bilingual Jew in Galilee, perhaps. Um, that would be a guess. Hmm. Um, yeah. So that being said, and based on what you uh, the, um, um, what you said earlier, and what you, what you said in your books about Jesus being a Torah reformer, based on uh, largely based on what uh, is in the Q document, the sayings of Jesus uh, that was uh, that shows his teachings. Do you think? How should I put this? Okay, here we go. Since Jesus was a Torah reformer, but not just that, but in the Gospels, he, he is opposed by both Romans and Jews alike. Do you think to some degree that Jesus what could have been 
not just a Torah reformer, but somewhat rebellious to have been crucified? Or do you think he was only crucified because he was specifically a Torah reformer? Um, the most important passage to answer that question is the healing of the centurion's son hmm. that appears immediately after the inaugural sermon where Jesus has articulated an alternative Torah that is more compassionate. And it includes passages like loving your enemy and turning your cheek. So when Jesus heals the son of the centurion, because the centurion says, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof and so on, um, Jesus says, this man has more faith than anybody in Israel. Now, that indicates that he at least is potentially um, trying to forgive his enemies and to make nice to Rome. Um, in the Q document, the enemies of Jesus are Torah enforcers and the Jerusalem temple establishment, but they are not the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and so on that are responsible for the death of Jesus. So the idea that Jesus was um, uh, the killed, the author of the Q document probably knows that Jesus was crucified because you have a passage that says, um, if you would follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. But there's nothing in the Q document, in my view, that would say that he is a direct threat to um, Roman hegemony. The problem is that he is a Jewish troublemaker, to be sure. And um, you can see this also in the execution of Jesus's brother James, who um, is accused of being, by some Jews, Torah uh, non-observant but by other Jews, that he was observant, which is mm. similar to what you have in the Q document, that the Q document is not against Torah. It's against a, a heartless application of Torah that makes the marginal victims and harms them. So uh, I think this passage in Josephus about the death of James is right on target. A Torah hardliners wanted to kill people because um, they wanted Israel to be faithful to Torah uh, universally. And others who also were Torah observant said, no, they're Torah observant enough. Um, so I think it was an inter-Jewish squabble that the Romans said, well, we're just gonna get rid of this troublemaker. He's just, I mean, they're, they're, they're not interested in the finer points of Jewish law. Mm. But Jesus is not a revolutionary in the way that some people would put it. He's not a he's not a zealot, uh, except that he's zealot for a, a more humane interpretation of law. Yeah, because I, I I know that there are there are several there are several authors and scholars out there like um, uh, um, the uh, the late S. G. F. Brandon, um, and others uh, like. Uh, Risa Aslan, uh, uh, right, exactly. They they think Jesus was a zealot, and they their arguments goes along the lines of something like this. I I know you're I know you're familiar um, with it, but just for, for the for the audience that doesn't know, they often like to use James as an inference on the matter because uh, somewhere in the New Testament it says I think it's in I think it's in Acts. I don't. Anyway, it says that James is zealous for the law. And they use the death of James. Um, actually, that's more that's more along the lines of Professor Eisman's thinking that J the death of James shows that he was a zealot. He, he argues in his epilogue, um, "Who and whatever James was, so too was Jesus." So, what would you say is are the most serious flaws in the zealot argument? First of all, mm -hmm. it's an attempt to make sense of Jesus's crucifixion. Mm. So, um, but we know that Romans crucified magicians and religious leaders as well as zealots. Mm. 
I think the, it is very difficult to put the um, ethical contours of Jesus as we have not only in the Q document, but also in Paul, in a context that could justify um, violence against Rome. And so I honestly think it's a fishing expedition, or put a different way. I think this way of making Jesus a zealot is you start with your conclusion and you a dumpster dive to find any scraps of evidence that you can patch together. Um, for example, all of these scholars are critical scholars and they know that the gospels are not xerographic copies of things that Jesus said or even what the apostles were preaching. But when it can, is convenient for them, they argue from the very passages that otherwise scholars would be skeptical about. So um, they, I don't think it's disciplined, Jacob. I don't mm. think the criteria are clear on what basis are you going to uh, adapt um, this saying and not another. Now, the way that often it gets argued, well, it's embarrassing, so it's unlikely that these authors would have created it. Well, um, th that actually is a fair argument in some cases, but I just think it's undisciplined, and it's a, it's a conclusion in search of evidence and argumentation. Going back to the James passage, I know you're familiar with uh, this uh, mythicist claim. Um, some there are some uh there's quite a bit of people in my audience that don't under that, that that don't fully understand and still don't fully understand um why scholars don't agree with dr carrier on this but um as you know dr carrier argues that james and josephus was not the same james as in the new testament the brother of jesus um even though in spite of the fact that origin of alexandria does say that josephus mentioned the death of james the brother of jesus who he did not believe he did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. Um, that being said, um, could you explain to the audience why scholars do not agree with him on this? That it's another interpolation that, James, that, and that he was actually the brother of Jesus, Ben Damnius. Um, okay, Richard Carrier is a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I have a tremendous respect for his intelligence and for the scope of his uh, work. So um, what I'm going to say can never be interpreted as an ad hominem. And also what I'm going to say, I have said to Richard, and we've actually been recording on this very thing face to face. So, um, but I can tell you what the problems are. First of all, the, the way that Josephus says, and there was a certain brother of Jesus named James. The name James does not come first. The name Jesus does, and it implies that the reader knows who this Jesus is. So the first thing that Richard does is he says, well, there are a lot of people in Josephus who are named Jesus. So which Jesus is, it was, is implied? Fair enough. The next is that he was Jesus's brother. Well, even if it was Jesus of Nazareth, brother is the term that Christians used for each other. Mm -hmm. But why doesn't he call about the, it says James and the brother of Jesus and others. Why aren't they called brothers? Well, maybe they're not Christians, but they're all going to die in the same way. The, sec the next is that he, I don't think, has a good translation uh, or did his own homework on the context. Annas is a, um, a Sadducees. The Josephus says, and the Sadducees have the strictest interpretation of Torah. Well, that could be, but it's also the case that they are responsible for the temple establishment. And they're not going to brook any uh, con uh, um, alternative to um, the, the, the temple establishment. And Annas, in an act of hubris, kills James and these others who are not called brothers. One is called a brother and the other, all, but they all die. 
And Josephus then says, people who are more lenient, but nonetheless accurate about the law, complain uh, to Rome that Annas um, was uh, in violation and that these people should no longer be published, punished, which means there are others, too, who have the same um, position. Now, I can understand why, given Richard's proposal of wanting to get rid of the historical Jesus, he has to go through those gymnastics. But none of those arguments, they are all uh, uh, work. They are all forced. This is an example of having to have a certain reading of Josephus and then running roughshod over what is most likely the evidence. So if one were to look at scholarship prior to uh, the year 2000, you're not going to find any question that this is uh, James, the brother of Jesus, and these other people were um, also believers and they had an alternative understanding of law and they were falling between the cracks of probably the Hillelites and the Shemites and, and, uh, and so on. So um, I feel very strongly about it because that probably is the best external evidence that we have for Jesus. And I just don't think you can um, smoke dope and get rid of it. And, um, and, the, and the reference in the James passage, who was called Christ, is, is, a, um, is argued by scholars to be a reference to the earlier, the Testimonium Flavianum. Uh, the, the way the passage is written, as you were just saying a moment ago, is is a reference to Jesus as if he was already discussed before in Josephus, because Josephus expects the reader to know which Jesus he's talking about. Right. The the testimony of Flavianum obviously is a Christian um, adaptation. Now, whether um, this whether it talked about Jesus at all in some different way or not. I don't know. Some people have thought maybe Eusebius was responsible. Eusebius knew Josephus, um, the writings, and uh, maybe he was responsible for the alteration. I mean, it's not impossible. But what's curious is that this reference to Jesus, that's the Christian interpolation, or at least exp um, expansion, appears in a group of Jewish troublemakers. It doesn't appear. There are other places where I think a reference to Jesus could have been made more generously. So why put it in the context of these troublemakers? And then I think they're trying to correct a problem that they saw already in Josephus, as opposed to um, crafting it uh, and just inserting it out of the blue. Mm. So going back to um, the discussion we were having earlier about the Q plus Papias again, um, when you mentioned that Luke, uh, that Papias doesn't know Luke and John, I wanted to I want to throw a question here about the Gospel of John. Professor um, Ehrman uh, thinks that John is a completely independent source that it doesn't use the synoptics. What's your what is your position on that? Do you think John is totally independent, or is it familiar with the synoptics? At every stage of the composition of John, we find evidence of the synoptics. Hmm. The, um, if the author of the Johannine epistles is the same John that is known by Papias, Papias is the one that talked about uh, Mark and two Matthews. But not only that, and this is so important, I'm so glad you asked this question. If one grants that Mark is indebted to Greek poetry, especially the Homeric epics. Mm. You have to grant that John knows the synoptics because those same stories appear in John. The walking on the water. I mean, I say the, um, the, the feeding of the 5,000, the stilling of the storm. No, the walking on the water. Um, the... Um, details in the death of Jesus, um, the anointing by a woman um, prior to his death. These all have unmistakable parallels in the Homeric epics. 
And if you want to say that John also is imitating the same Homeric epics, you've got a bigger problem than I do. He knows them from the synoptics. And um, I'm actually coming out with a, th a three volume work. The first is called the Mimetic Synopsis of the, Go the, the uh, Four Synoptic Gospels, which includes Q. The second one is a synthesis of the Acts of the Apostles with Greek poetry. And the third is the Gospel of John. He has a synopsis of its three layers of composition. But Jacob at the first and the last um, layers of composition, the authors clearly know the synoptic gospels it is not an independent work and uh, i just think one has to put that to rest forever mm. now one of the I by wanna... the way one other mm. thing i told bart Ehrman years ago that he has to rewrite his introduction to the new testament because it is useless when it comes to the synoptic gospels because he fails to recognize or even admit, uh, even um, in a footnote, indicate that other people have argued that uh, these texts are not coming from Christian tradition or uh, Greco Roman prose, but they're uh, imitations of Greek poetry. And um, he wrote me off right away. He, re he just blew me off. Why do you think he's so strongly? Um... Uh, uh, rejective of this. He has too much invested, literally invested, in his scholarship to mm -hmm. admit to, to admit to admit that wrong. And I think that's characteristic of the field generally. I think people are threatened because if this is right, so much that's written on the Gospels it, it has to be rethought. So I have a question for you about Paul because there's a there's a few sayings of Jesus um, in Paul's epistles. Um, do you think it's possible that those sayings of Jesus that uh, that Paul briefly quotes um, goes uh, does that do you think that that the, do you think those sayings go back to the historical Jesus or they could have originally have possibly have been in the Q document or even in a separate document or is it oral tradition? What's your position on that? Uh, I th again, that's an excellent question. I think when we have a, that our best evidence for the teachings of Jesus are places where you get overlapping content between Paul and Q, mm. because neither is interested in creating a narrative. Um, uh, well, no, that's not true. I mean, the Q document is creating a narrative mm. in, in a way. But you have, um, in these sayings, you have a similar moral horizon. Um, talk about the kingdom of God, loving one's enemies, the divorce legislation, um, anticipations of Jesus's return, and so on. So I think the closest we can get to the sayings of Jesus is exactly what you're saying. It's these sayings in Paul that have ver reverberations in the synoptics. And if you take a look at uh, my Q or other cues, you'll find that there are several of those saying, I think there are about eight of them, have uh, overlapping content with, uh, with Q. In, his, uh, in Paul's epistles uh, to the Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he makes, a, he makes a mention of the rulers of the age. And in 1st Thessalonians, he says the Jews had killed Jesus. Do you um, do you think the rulers of the age in the letters to the Corinthians are a reference to the Jews? And the reason why he doesn't say who the rulers of the age are is because he expects his audience to know he's talking about the Jews who killed Jesus. No, I don't think that. Okay, I, I, I would not hold that. Okay, the reason uh, another reason I ask about about the rulers of the age is who do you think he is referring to? when he uh, makes that statement? Um, I think he's referring to demonic powers. Okay. And does he, uh, do you think he thinks that the, de de the demonic powers are behind those who killed Jesus on earth? Is that yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
And another reason I asked this question, because as you know, um, Mephistus argue, Dr. Carrier again, <laughs> he argues that the rulers of the age were completely demonic and that it has no connection to Earth at all and that this somehow is, is happening in outer space and he, and he looks at the Greek, he translates, it, he translates some of the things that Paul says differently than uh, scholars typically do. Could you, ex um, could you explain why scholars in general think that it, despite that, that, that they think that the rulers of the age are demonic powers that are behind the people that killed Jesus, why does it still involve human beings in that context? Tell me, uh, Jacob, I'm good. this is going to sound ungenerous, okay? Okay. Can you give me an example of demonic powers that crucify people other than Jesus? No. The crucifixion is, in my view, the one unnegotiable historical fact about Jesus. And it was an embarrassment for early Christians. And the idea that this is some cosmic crucifixion that gets historicized is really preposterous. So um, the other thing he argues is, as I'm, as I'm sure you're familiar with, is the ascension of Isaiah. He thinks there's an earlier dating for the ascension of Isaiah. Or, hold on, let me correct that. He thinks it's possible that there might have been an earlier version of the Ascension of Isaiah that predates Paul, and that the Ascension of Isaiah thinks, it, in his interpretation, the Ascension of Isaiah places Jesus' death in the cosmos. So that takes me to this next question. The Ascension of Isaiah is typically dated late, like second century. I think some scholars place it in the first century. Would you say that the Ascension of Isaiah is pretty much written after the, after the New Testament was written and it's extremely late? Uh, I'm not an authority on the Ascension of Isaiah. It's been a long time since I've worked on it. But I can say that okay. there were two scholars um, writing in French, Enrico Norelli, I think, was one of them, who did magnificent work mm. on the Ascension of Isaiah and argued for its cohesiveness and that it had a particular, uh, came out of a particular kind of theological moment in com community. So if I were to be involved in the discussion, and I just said, I'm not an expert on mm -hmm. it, um, that's where I would start um, to see um, what these people did because they were really groundbreaking in, in uh, how they understood the text. And it's been a long time since I heard them talk about it. Hmm. Yeah, because I just wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to ask those questions because again, um, there are many people in the audience that are not familiar um, with the exact positions uh, that scholars have on these issues. Um, that being said, um, the tomb, the tomb narrative, there's, that's been coming up even more lately, especially with going back to Professor Ehrman again. Um, in the interview I did with him, he, he talks about that about, what, I think it was six years ago, he said that he changed his position on the tomb story, and he thinks that the tomb narrative was not historical, and he's, he's went through many sources, and he thinks that Jesus was left on the cross, and he was never buried. Could you explain to the audience what your position on that is? Do you think there was a, a historical tomb narrative that's been exaggerated? Was he buried? What's your position on this? Um, the narrative we have, obviously, is a crafted narrative, and it has analogies in the Iliad mm -hmm. with the death of Hector. So um, my, I think the Gospels on this question are nearly, um, we should ignore them mm. because they, they have too much literary stuff. Now, but Paul argues that Jesus died and was buried. Mm. And that's already independent tradition of anything we've got in the Gospels. And... <clears throat> 
he argues then that after that time Jesus was seen, but it wasn't. He doesn't mention an empty tomb. He doesn't. You and you can see um, spirits or souls in antiquity, and not just bodies. In fact, Paul has to struggle to make it visual, and he talks about it being a spiritual body. Hmm. Well, what in the heck is a spiritual body? It's something that can be seen and it has a certain amount of materiality, but flesh and bone cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And Christian apologists go crazy trying to figure out all that and put it together. And I just think it's unfortunate. So um, if I guess I would trust the tradition that Paul received that he was that Jesus was crucified and buried. Um but he doesn't, if he knew the empty tomb, he would have been a fool not to refer to the empty tomb. So, yeah, it was a, it was a tomb, and I'm sure Jesus' bones rotted like mine are going to someday. Going back to the independent sources discussion uh, that we were having earlier, which sources that we have about Jesus do you consider to be independent sources? Um, Paul, Josephus, and Q. All right. Um, do you think that the... I um, Ah, here it is. Okay. You mentioned an, an, an amazing... One of the amazing parallels you mentioned is the parallels between Homer and Jesus calming the storm. Could you um, provide a few examples to the audience of some of Jesus's miracles paralleling Homer in that way. Um, yeah, so it, it wasn't Homer who uh, who uh, stilled the storm. It was his Odysseus, that's right. Ah. Um, no, we have lots of examples of it. One of my favorites is that Odysseus is keeping his identity a secret. Mm. And... Um, In, in order to reveal his true identity to his servants and to his wife, he bears the scar that's on his thigh that had been re, uh, caused by a boar. So what happens in the Gospel of Luke? Jesus uh, um, reveals his identity by showing the wounds on his hands and his feet. And um, so then they recognize that the, the that Jesus has uh, come back um, from the dead. The woman who anoints Jesus for his burial seems to recognize that he's soon going to die. Eurycleia, whose name re means renowned far and wide, Odysseus' slave woman, recognizes who that her Lord has returned by looking at the scar on his leg. And it's said in Mark that what this woman has been has done will be known far and wide. When um, Byzantine poets retold the story, they used those lines in order to retell the story. Hmm. Um, so, it, I mean, I could go on if you want some more examples. Sure. I could get you, sure. You want some more examples? Yeah, yeah that'd be good. Um. The feeding of the 5,000, um, it resembles Nestor's feeding 4,500 men. And by the way, in Mark, it's all men, it's not women, mm. um, at the shore of the sea. And he has them seat, uh, seated on the, the grass, the way Nestor had people seated on, uh, on the beach. And they're in groups of 50s and 100s. Um, and, uh, Nestor had them in, seating in, in, in groups of 50. Um, Odysseus, um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, o Odysseus is asleep on the boat when his companions release the bag of winds and they get blown back to Aeolus's island and they have to spend nine more years trying to get home. Odysseus is asleep on a boat, a storm arises, and his uh, companions aren't able to still the storm, and Jesus stills the storm. 
Probably the best one is the Gerasene demoniac story. <coughs> it's a combination of Polyphemus and the Circe story. Odysseus goes to an island. He gets off the boat. He finds a person who lives in a cave. The person, no one can subdue this person. Um, and uh, like Circe, he can turn soldiers into swine and then drown them in the ocean. Odysseus's men drown on their way home. I mean, the, the parallels really go on and on. There are dozens of them. Hmm. And I would like, uh, I would like our, our next discussion um, at some point to be all about Homer's parallels to Jesus because the parallels you've gone through already are, are, are amazing. I think that I think the audience will be very amazed by the additional parallels that you've outlined between Jesus and Homer during our next discussion. Um, that being said, I think we can uh, we can stop here for now. Um, Professor Dennis, thank you for joining me. Um, I love the parallels that you've gone through here. Uh, the, the your work on Q uh, being structured upon the Book of Deuteronomy is highly convincing. At least it is to me. And I have a feeling several people in the audience will feel the same way after they see this video. All right, everybody, don't forget to like, subscribe, check the links in the description. I will have Professor Dennis's Amazon page in the description and many other links that you can go to. You got to you gotta get this book. It's a really good book. I enjoyed reading it. And I think many of you will too. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.